Thank you so much for having me here in Iowa. I'm really excited about this, even the title of the conference, The Harvesting a Comprehensible Classroom. Because a comprehensible classroom leads to a plentiful harvest. And that plentiful harvest for us means <coughs> high retention rates in our upper level classes. And why is that important? Because those students that we've left behind in the past have gone on to become our legislators. And we know what legislators have done to language education. So we need to make sure as many of our students as possible are going away with a really positive feeling about what it's like to learn languages and about how important being bilingual or multilingual is in our society. So as we talk today about our plentiful harvest, I just want you to remember that that harvest is our retention across the years of our curriculum. If you would like to get a hold of me at any time after the conference, I wanted to share these. You're welcome to shoot a picture of any of the slides that you want to. Um, my blog is somewhere to share.com. I share a lot of the things that are going on in our classroom so that if you'd like to see what we're doing at all the different levels, you can. My email is senoracmt at gmail.com. And please tweet out from the keynote, from the sessions, if you come to any of our afternoon sessions today. There are a lot of teachers who don't have the funding to get out, and they stay at home and they watch Twitter for the things that teachers are telling them are happening at conferences around the United States. So while I leave that up there, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I have been teaching for 23 years. Uh, this last year, I took a new job. Now, that is an interesting place to be in, 22 years experience and starting over as a brand newbie. And it has given me a lot of insight on what this plentiful harvest really looks like. I had gotten accustomed to my classroom where we had some pretty high retention rates. And to come into a school that was down to about 3% retention in level four, uh, it was kind of a shock to me uh, to go back to that beginning. And so I've had to start harvesting again. And the number one point that I want to have you take home today I'm going to talk to you about a lot of different things, but if you take only one thing away with you, it's that we're farming for the long run. And to ask yourself, when I go into my classroom, am I really farming for that long-term end goal of creating students who will go out with positive feelings about language education? So i got to give you a little farming history of me. I don't know much about farming. My mom was a farm girl. Her parents had a farm, but her dad died before I was born, and her mom rented out all the other farmland. So she kept a small section where we had a strawberry patch. And strawberries are a really great metaphor for language educators because in that first year that you have strawberry plants, you put them out in your rows, and you don't grow berries on them. You pick off the little buds, all the little flowers, and the strawberry plant will throw out a runner. And you take that plant and you plant it between two more. And the next year you get nice, full-looking rows that produce really great berries. So we always have that in our Spanish ones. We've got our nice little plants. You know, they're all budding and stuff. But somehow, sometimes we forget that we're not supposed to just think that's the harvest right there at the end of level one. And we're planning for the future. After about three years, strawberries just kind of stop producing. Language classrooms, after about three years, it seems like they're all gone. Nobody comes back, and we don't want that. We want to be farming for that long-term goal. I wasn't ever a very good farmer out in the strawberry patch because I like to eat them. And I found that I wasn't a very good farmer teacher either. Um, this is a really good metaphor for the first few years of my teaching career. I think every one of you, if you think back to when you started out in studying your language and becoming a teacher, it was because there was some teacher in your background that was highly impactful to you. Most of us didn't go into teaching language because we had a terrible teacher and we wanted to go to college to prove that guy wrong. Uh, most of us look back and we think, oh, you know, Mr. Middleton, he was an inspiration to me. I want to be just like him. So I came out of college, and I took my first job. And it was textbook adoption year. So I adopted the textbook that I had used in college, or in high school. And it was a new version. It was Paso a Paso. Is anybody old enough to remember those? Oh, OK. There's my people. Uh, for you guys that are newer, it's Realidad is this grandpa. Uh, so, uh, Paso a Paso had just come out bought those books and I went into my classroom and I started teaching. And I taught like Mr. 
Middleton did. And I was not good at it, you guys. My harvests looked terrible, but I thought I was doing a good job. I loved going to class every day, but I wasn't farming for the long run because I had different goals. Instead of how many kids can I keep into level four, my thought was, in Spanish 1, they come in and I give them their vocabulary quizzes and I take off for accents and some of those guys can't spell and man, they're terrible at conjugating verbs. Some of these guys just aren't cut out to learn a language. And so at semester, when they're getting these and Fs, they'll drop. And then when they drop, things will get a little bit better. So my first farming goal was to get rid of the chaff, the riffraff well, off the top. Those guys could be my next principal. Those guys could be a legislator. And I was letting them just slide off because instead of looking at what I could do differently in my practice to make learning language more meaningful for them, I was ready to get rid of them so I could get to the good stuff. And then the next semester, between one and two, we'd have 80 start and we'd have 50 start Spanish too. And by that time, I had really gotten to some kids that were good at language, which was great because we did all Frederick and Perfect in that year. And it was really hard, so those guys wouldn't have done well. <laughs> but look at my field here. I'm walking along and I have 80 rows of corn to start and I turn around after you know one growing season and now I only have 50 to start with the next and I'm not worried about those 30 rows of corn that I lost at all. And then... The next big monument for me was teaching into that third year because in the school that I went to, that I taught at, they didn't really encourage taking upper level language. They said two years would meet your college requirement. So then I would end up with about eight. You guys, that's 10% of my crop left. And I wasn't seeing any like big red flashing lights yet that you're terrible at farming. <laughs> but, uh, because those eight were great. You know what kinds of conversations we could have about language, not in the language. We were talking about subjunctive, and we were talking about imperfect and credit and what each one was used for. And barely ever, I'd put up a little sign, and it would say, no English today. And then they'd go, oh, no, no English today. So Spanish wasn't something they were doing because they were engaged by learning the language. It was something they were taking to look better on their college application. And level four was barely existent. I had two students to four students every year who were signed up in the class. So this continued on the first five years. And I had one of those old school principals whose belief system was it took two years to get tenure. So you get evaluated twice each year. The first time you need improvement. The second time you're satisfactory, the next year you're satisfactory, and then you're excellent, and you're excellent the rest of your teaching career. <laughs> so I had no reason to want to change because I'm getting these excellent evaluations. The whole farm is burning down, and I get an excellent evaluation every year. So we get a new principal when this guy retires. And this guy came from Chicago. And <laughs> I'm in Southern Illinois, and you know what we think about people from Chicago. They're highfalutin. <laughs> so he came in, and he has this education as a principal. And I think he sits me down after my evaluation. So he came in on my year six. In year seven, it's the first time I have to be evaluated by him. So he comes in, and he says, you know, let's talk about this. I'm going to give you a satisfactory. Excuse me, I've been excellent for five years now. You can't give me a satisfactory. He said, I have seen a lot of really great new trends in language education. Mind you, this is the year 2000. So he sits me down and he says, have you ever heard of TPR storytelling? It's great. You use language to teach your kids. Have you ever heard of flexible seating? You can put your kids in pot." Nobody had heard of flexible seating back then where I live. And so he said, and centers, oh, you can do centers, and they can listen, and they can speak, and they can read. And I thought to myself, who's this guy? <laughs> uh, he didn't go to school to become a foreign language teacher. I did, and I had Mr. Middleton, and he was the best Spanish teacher that ever walked the face of the earth, and so he could not possibly be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I refused to change that. And I said, thank you for your input, <laughs> <laughs> sir. <laughs> uh, I read online a 
another day, don't be that teacher that does one year of lesson plans in the plan book and then teaches it 35 times. But I was that teacher. I just went through the text the exact same way every year. Well, you know, it made me a little uncomfortable. And so I taught 30 minutes to the east of my hometown. And there was a job opening 30 minutes to the west of my hometown. And it was a little closer to St. Louis, Missouri. And my husband and I were like, you know, let's just do this. Let's get away from this guy. So I went over there. But over the summer, it started eating at me. Because he'd said some things like, you know, you're doing it kind of traditionally. There are new things out there. So I get into this new school, and it's textbook adoption time at the new school. And so Paso a Paso had given birth, and now there was Rally Dottis, the 2000 version. So I ordered those books, and it came with a TBR storytelling supplement. And I thought, hey, I could try one thing that he said. And so we would do these gestures and stand up, but it was more like a brain break. It didn't go anywhere any further than level one, a way to get them warmed up, and then we'd go right back to the textbook. But you know what I noticed in that first year of doing that? They, their little eyes lit up. When we were using language and being <coughs> active with it, they were really attentive. And then I'd say, sit down, open your books to page five. And then let's do workbook page 29, 30, 31, and 35 today. And they would just lose all of that interest that they had in foreign language. So I continued teaching with a little bit of TPRS. And in 2005, I decided to do this national board certification process. Has anybody done it? Ah, oh, there we go. It is intense to do national board certification. It's four papers, six tests. Um, it takes a little bit of time, but it was the best professional development I ever had. And I say that because I didn't pass the first time. Uh, as you can see, I was a failing teacher farmer, but in my mind I was going to conferences. I had an index card game for any grammar concept you can name right now. Name it, I could pull out these cards and we'd play these fun games and we'd play verb battleship. And we had cheers where we'd pound and chop our desks. And, and they had fun, but they, it never retained in Spanish 4. They'd say, yo, hablar español on their paper, and I would throw up and die a little inside because after all this conjugating we've done, this is what you've come away with. I uh, go hablar. And remember, I told you about my retention rate. This is like the four students that are the best in the whole wide world that wrote yo, hablar. That is pitiful. So I said, I send off my portfolio to National Board thinking that I'm going to get certified. They tell you 50% don't pass in the first time, but you always think in the back of your mind, you know, I'm working really hard at this, or, you know, uh, and it's not going to be me. And then I opened my scores, and it was me. And I said, well, it's stages of grief. First I said, no, this is a right. Okay, hold on, close that out. Let me log back in. <laughs> and so I log back in, and it's still me. Uh, we are sorry to inform you that you did not achieve this time. And then there comes the anger. Well, you guys just don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, kind of like with that principle. And then after a while, you sit and simmer on this, and you start to get into that point of kind of acceptance and uh, reflection. And what I found was that when I looked back at my papers, I had blamed my props for failing. So for example, you had to design instruction over time. Oh, okay, I'm gonna tell you a deep dark secret. My two lowest scores, this is graded out a four point scale. My two lowest scores on a paper, I got one out of four. That means there is no evidence this teacher is capable of doing this. And it was designing instruction over time. You know none of the secrets to farming. Zero. We have no evidence that you know this. The second one was one of the tests. 1.25 on knowledge of how language acquisition works. So what this test basically told me was, you are a terrible farmer. You're going to get your farm foreclosed right away. <laughs> and what I realized, guys, thinking back to my strawberry patch that I worked in with my grandma, when my cousin and I were little, she used to let us pack up quarts of strawberries. And if we packed up the quarts of strawberries to sell at the patch for people that didn't want to you pick themselves, uh, you, could, you couldn't fill them up with all perfect berries. Like, there just aren't that many. 
And you know this if you go to Walmart and get the strawberry thing and you pull them out and you're like, hey, <laughs> these are green underneath here. You put the best berries on the top and then those little nubbly ones. Those nubbly ones are going to become the next president and your legislator and probably your superintendent. And so even though they're ugly and you will hide in the bottom of the basket, you got to harvest those berries too. And they come along at different... Sometimes you get one with kind of a green top. That's that kid that takes until Spanish four to finally become a novice high. Um, so I started to realize I had been farming for very short-term goals and that I needed to fill my quarts up with a little bit more variety in my berries, let's say. But I didn't even know where to start because I told you the only experience I had was with Senor Middleton and then my college professors who did, you know, grammar stuff too. So it was 2005 and thank God by then Google had been born. And so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, in Illinois at the time there was this big push for teachers to become highly effective. And if you're highly effective, you've got the maximum certification in your area. So I thought, well, okay, I'll Google how to be highly effective and how to teach language. And I came up with two farmer mentors. <laughs> uh, on the left is my first and the granddaddy of language farmer mentors. That's Dr. Stephen Krashen. And in the bottom right there, that is Stephen Covey. He wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So, uh, these became my mentors as I was going through this sort of paradigm shift in my classroom. Because like I said, I was totally resistant to any kind of a change. I wasn't ready to admit that there was something wrong until I finally reflected on those national board scores. Looking at my paper, I'm reading along and it says, Hannah is a natural student. She did a great job on this quiz because Spanish is so easy for her and it clicks and she's a great speller, blah, blah, blah. And Andy, student B, his parents make him take Spanish. <laughs> Andy doesn't want to take Spanish. He works two jobs. He plays golf. He doesn't study. 37 excuses for why Andy didn't do well on the test. Never once what I was doing was not the right way to approach Andy. This is what I should have done differently. I had just blamed the crop for failing. Sorry, I, I didn't water it. I thought it would water itself. <laughs> so as I look at these habits of highly effective people, I start trying to implement some of them in my classroom. And as I look at some of Krashen's input hypotheses, I w I'm such a fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> we got to be in a Senor Woolley video together, and that was just <laughs> the best. <laughs> Contexts. 
It doesn't say anything about subjunctive. So teacher candidates that don't study abroad are having trouble using present, past, and future in a way that a native speaker can understand them. And I was expecting my sophomores to have mastered preterite and imperfect and all of their nuances. And then I never talked about them again because I had to do subjunctive and future tense and conditional tense and all of the perfects and all of this stuff that wasn't really making them more proficient speakers. So you have to begin with the end in mind. If my end is that I want them to be proficient, then back at the beginning in Spanish 1, I need to tell them some stories in the present tense. And then I need to retell them in the past tense. And then I need to ask them questions. What do you think is going to happen to that character? And they don't have to produce it, but they can hear it and understand it. And so beginning with the end in mind became a thing that I did in my classroom to try and increase student proficiency and engagement. And along with that engagement, this is think win-win. So highly effective people think win-win. What's that look like in our classroom? Well, if we want to have a plentiful harvest, if we want to farm for the long run, it doesn't have to just be engaging to our students. It needs to be engaging to us, too. Like, you need to go in, if you're going to go long haul farming, you're going to teach all the way through your career, really excited about your language and converting students into lovers of language, you got to go in there happy to go every day. If you're, I read online the other day, too, that Will Rogers said, uh, you have to be an optimist to be a farmer or you won't be a farmer. <laughs> and I think it's the same thing with a teacher. You have to go in with a really positive attitude every year or else you can't be a teacher anymore. So I have trouble thinking win-win as I go into my new classroom last year. I told you I went to a new school where they had been traditionally, realidades, textbook taught. So I knew where they were coming from, but it had been now 10 years since I had used a textbook. Walked into Spanish 3 and 4 with this idea that I was going to teach them through a story on the first day. And they had a literal panic attack. And, uh, oh, what are you saying? Um, they didn't know has and wants and needs. And they just, it was scary to them. So I thought, okay, well, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to do this really simply. So we went back to kind of a level one kind of level. I knew what I wanted to talk to them about. This is a group of kids who had expressed the idea that they were into science. And science has a lot of great cognates. So if I'm going to bring in some higher level vocabulary that's still a cognate, science is a good way to do that. So I thought, okay, I'll give them some foundation. We'll tell a story about this kid, Jennings. This is a combined Spanish three and four. Uh, at the school that I teach at now, they had 105 in level one. And in the 3-4, there were four, 16 threes and 6 fours. Jennings is a 4, and the snake is dash. Uh, dash is a 3. So Jennings went to the, the rainforest, and all of the things that happened were very much level 1 things. Like Jennings took a picture of himself with a snake. And the snake tried to eat Jennings, but Tarzan grabbed Jennings. Like, all of these reviews, and I'd stop and we'd say, why was it grabbed with the O accent? You know, to give them, they were grammarians, so they needed to feel like that. <laughs> it was a fun day. They had a great time making up the story. The kid that played Tarzan was awesome. Jennings was awesome. Like, I just had good actors that day. But the best part was that it sort of changed their attitude about language. All of a sudden, they were like, oh, we can't understand. It was a non-threatening way to speak language to them. And at the end of the year, when I gave them their survey, you know, what things were most impactful for you, Jennings actually wrote, that day that we told the story about me going to the rainforest, I knew that I was actually going to be learning to use Spanish and that I was going to love doing it. And I thought, that's, that was a win, because that's how I felt when they left that day. I felt like this is our breakthrough moment. And they felt that way, too. And along with that, you have to seek to understand before you can be understood. So I told you, this science unit, I was really excited for them because they're into their chemistry and biology. That group just happened to be very involved in their science classes. And I have a friend. I'm going to recommend right now you become a stalker because <laughs> I am a super internet creep. And I find people that I think I might get resources from, and I stalk them kindly until I get what I want. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I went to Panama 
uh, in 2006 with a group of students. And our tour guide was a great guide. And I've had good guides before, but this tour guide, you kind of know when you've got a special case. And this one would come out in the evenings. Now, all the other ones I'd had would, like, as soon as we got back to the hotel, they were gone until morning. <laughs> and this one would come out and go, hey, you guys want to play a game? Let's keep you busy. And so I thought, I'm tapping that resource <laughs> later. So I emailed them, and I was like, hey, you know, I kind of like to do the science unit with my kids. Do you think you could go out in the rainforest and make me some videos? Because we have a big forest and a reservoir right across from the school, and I'd love for them to see the difference in what's in your forest and what's in our forest. And he was like, yeah. And so he sends me this video of him with a sloth hanging over his shoulder in a tree. And I'm like, oh, go. Like, they're going to really get this, right? Because I'm. I'm seeking to understand what they like, culture, uh, science, and, and sloths. Who doesn't like sloths? <laughs> but I played this video and they were terrified. I even put subtitles of the Spanish on it in Spanish, you know, so they could read a lot. Mm, they had never heard a native speaker before. So I was like, dang it, back to square one. So then I'm like, well, what would you guys like to know? And so they came up with questions. And each group of two asked a question, and we sent them to him, and he responded to their personal questions. Once I understood what they really wanted to know, they totally understood his answers because they were more open to that idea that they could use Spanish effectively. So as you change to this CI-based classroom, it is about using language that's comprehensible to your students, but there's also something to be said for really like asking them what is it that you're most interested in knowing? What can we do? I used to teach, when I had that crop of like 10% of my crop left, I was teaching only to people who might teach language in the future. But that's the majority of the kids are not doing that. So how can we make it seem like something they can use in their career, no matter who they are? And then we went on and we figured out that we needed to synergize. Uh, synergize is one of those buzzwords, and I hate buzzwords, but it's one of the habits of highly effective people, and all it means is teamwork. And what I would encourage is that as you're working together as a team, you remember that synergy is about taking everybody's strengths. And so when you come back after a conference like this and you're on fire about CI, sometimes it's easy to bull in there and say, okay, we're going to do it this way this year. And not everybody's comfortable at that place. So let everybody bring their strength in as you make the transition. I wasn't ready when Principal Fricknick told me that I needed to bring in some more modern things. I had to come to that point on my own. But he did open a little door by telling me about it. Because otherwise I would have just gone on in my same rut. This is my colleague Chrissy at my new school. <coughs> so we teach in the same county when I was at my old school. And she knew who I was. And she knew what I did in my classroom. And she was part of this, it was three teachers, and then the enrollment dropped, and it was two teachers, and then the enrollment dropped. And they told them before last year, they were down to one and four fifths positions, and that they would stretch the Spanish ones out into smaller classes to keep them two full time. But if things didn't turn around, it was not going to be two full positions anymore. So the other teacher left. And so when I came in, she said, I know what you're going to want to do. <laughs> and I just want you to know that I'm terrified. Uh, because I want to change. I know that things have not been right. And I know that this shrinking program is wrong for us. She said, but I have, I have no idea what else to do. And so we worked together all year this year. With her taking these little baby steps and kind of guiding the Spanish ones, I just had one section of them. She had all the rest. And so she, she took little steps. She loved teaching with novels. That was something that she could understand that was in her wheelhouse. So we did some teaching with novels. We got Martina Bex's curriculum because Martina Bex does a great job. If you have a colleague that's coming in new to CI, Martina does a good job of walking the line between really doing CI and letting that person have a little bit of grammar to fall back on because that's an important step for somebody jumping out of the textbook boat. I had two years where I spent um, TPRS stories with the vocab and then going back to the grammar of the textbook before I finally threw it out and went just all creating my own curriculum. Chrissy was not getting any of that, so I needed a, a baby step for her. 
And together, we did, a, you know, we did some great lesson plans this year. And this summer, she's going to go to IFLT for training. So she's ready now to take on uh, CI, a comprehensible classroom. And our harvest is getting bigger. We started the year with a very small three and a really small four, six kids. Uh, next year, we have 125, so we're up in Spanish 1. We have 80, which is up again in Spanish 2. And for our Spanish 3s next year, we're jumping from 16 to 51. Whoa. And so that is a huge move, two sections of Spanish 3. And Spanish 4 had, 3 had 16 last year. Two graduated, all 14 that are left are going on to Spanish 4 for next year. So it is a huge change and what our crop looks like. And we're hoping to continue that uh, as we move forward. Uh, but you'll have to go back and remember that teamwork piece. Give them time to come to these realizations on their own. And the best, I think, for us as teachers, because this plentiful harvest isn't just in our students. We want to harvest teachers who come to the classroom and stay in the classroom because you know that there's a lot of attrition in teachers right now, too. And so it's about sharpening the saw. Sharpening the saw just means getting your own training, finding things that you can read that you enjoy, and finding things out there that you can tweet about. You're here at a conference today. You're the kind of teachers who are sharpening your saw. Who goes to a conference on Saturday of the summer? Like, think about the other faculty at your school. Language teachers are powerhouses of sharpening our saws. Because we have lots of great training. Give yourselves a hand. I mean, this is a beautiful <laughs> on a Saturday in the summer. And so, but there are people that couldn't do it. And for whatever reason, sometimes it's family commitments. And sometimes it's financial commitments that they just can't make it to the conferences. So be attentive to, you know, tweeting out to them. Make it a bucket list thing to go to ACTFL one time in your career. If you've never been, ACTFL is very, very impressive. To go into a room with eight to 10,000 other language teachers, uh, to go to sessions that are presented by really, really important people, uh, it's amazing. And so make that an item, like we always plan for vacation or whatever, plan for a bucket list of ACTFL. And don't just sharpen your saw with teachers in your own language. This girl in the pink sweatshirt in the front row there, uh, that is Paige. Paige was my student. She went on to become a Spanish and English teacher. She majored in both. She studied abroad in Spanish. She student taught in English. And she came back to our home school uh, where I left to go to Salem. And she taught with me. So she was my colleague in Spanish. When our program grew to need a teacher and a half, she was the half. And so we planned a lot together, but what we found out was her English lessons really worked well in my upper level Spanish classes. So we could kind of co-plan, and we're very like-minded in our planning. And then Paige left me. Three years in, she left me to go to Salem. And I said, I can't believe you're leaving me. And then the next year, I got a job at Salem, and I went and joined her, and we're back together, back in action. And these are our shared kids. This is my Spanish 3 and 4 class. It's during her prep period. Uh, sometimes we do a brain break of a five-minute rave, and we put on this uh, YouTube video, Mundo Gai, G-U-Y-I. Uh, he does all kinds of Zumba to the current pop hits. Awesome. So we'll throw that on, and we'll dance, and she'll come up and dance with us. But we share a lot of lessons. We share a lot of literary kind of ideas. And they know that we collaborate and sharpen saws together. So just to, to show you where our harvest is right now, I taught a lot of years with only three Spanish teachers that came out of those first 15 years of my career. Since that time, since I've been teaching with comprehensible input, with cultural units, with things that the kids want to know, that number has really grown. The number of minors and majors in Spanish has grown. And I just want to share a couple. Uh, the girl on the left, is my daughter, Allison. She is just finishing her freshman year in college. The girl on the right is her friend, Kayla, who just finished her sophomore year of college. Uh, Kayla and Allison are both Spanish majors. <clears throat> They're two of 10 that I have in school right now who are majoring in Spanish. And that never, in, in the 15 years of the beginning of my career, it never happened. It was CI. 
It was planning for this future harvest that really turned things around. Kayla went to school to be a bilingual doctor. And when she got into her college classroom, and this is my best moment ever, she got in there, and in the first week, it was so grammar heavy that half the class dropped. And she emailed me and she said, what is this? Why do they want people to drop? They would want to build their program, right? And I said, what can I tell you, Kayla? It's different at the university. She went to her second level of class, five students. Third level of class, five students. She was like, where are all the people? They're killing them off. Kayla changed her major. She's going to become a professor. And she's going to change the college Spanish speakers from the inside out. So go Kayla. Allison is a free spirit. She's not going to be a teacher. <laughs> Allison's not going to be a teacher. Allison is a world traveler. Allison's major is Spanish. And her uh, double major is global studies. She's minoring in French and Italian and creative writing, and Allison's life dream is to become a travel blogger or a famous YouTuber, uh, sharing her adventures around the world. She loves being bilingual. She wants to be a polyglot, and it's not because I taught her out of a textbook. It's because we looked at world cultures. This is Allison in Ecuador on her first mini-study abroad. She just came back from Taiwan. Uh, this is Kayla in Spain on her full semester study abroad. The kids are going out there into the world. And it's because I started farming for the long run. They're staying in it now for the long haul. And so as you go back, keep that optimistic side in mind. You're going to go back to school and you're going to think, I can keep a bunch of these students in here. And I just want you to remember to farm for that long run and to plant the seeds that will keep them in and enroll them becoming lifelong lovers and learners of language. Thank you guys so much.